you have your Bibles, would you turn to Psalm 27? Psalm 27. So over the past few summers, we've had the opportunity to spend the summer weeks when college kids are gone um, and you guys, we begin to travel on vacation and stuff. Um, The summer weeks that we spend looking at some of our favorite psalms and see Jesus through their psalms, or we would have the preaching cohort speak, and um, they would speak through um, passages that were assigned to them. Last year, the cohort worked through the book of James, and it was a phenomenal series. This year, the cohort ran a little late, so they will be to teach beginning in August, and they are going to be working through the parables. And I've been really encouraged by these guys, and so you guys are in for a really, really good treat starting in August when the guys in the cohort are going to be sharing from the Word. but So this summer, we get to have a mix of psalms and cohort. And so we're going to begin this week in looking at several psalms that have been meaningful for um, those of us who are preaching and look at how these psalms point us toward Jesus. I personally love the psalms. A few years ago, I read a book by a man by Donald Whitney called Praying the Bible. And in his book, Whitney encourages us to use God's word to pray deeper prayers. And I've been trying to incorporate that practice into my own prayer life, and the process has been incredible. It's been a game changer for me. Basically opening up a passage of Psalms and reading through that passage and basically saying, for example, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, pausing and saying, God, thank you for being my shepherd You lead me, you guide me, you provide for me. And using scripture to pray God's word back to him. The Psalms are so powerful because the Psalms teach us how to pray. Friends, I know the struggle is real when it comes to praying. Often it feels like we're repeating the same words over and over. And sometimes it's frustrating because it seems like our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and no one is listening to them. But the truth is, if you want to grow in your walk with Jesus, we have to pray. Pray for a follower of Jesus is our lifeblood. The Psalms are such a great resource to help us to pray. They help us respond to pray to the truths of God's word. They help us to pray in all of human life, the good, the bad, the ugly. This week, our family experienced tragedy. Uh, My wife's Um, relative who was 37 years old, slipped and fell in Houston, hit the back of her head. She passed away, um, leaving behind a five-year-old, a three-year-old. We were there at the funeral. But even in the services, the Psalms just kept ringing out. That God, you're a God who's there in the midst of grief. That God, you're a God who's there in the midst of pain and anguish. The Psalms are sometimes raw. They're honest expressions of our emotions before God when we don't know what to say. And so these psalms are rich. And so when we study these psalms, they are helpful to see Jesus and draw close to him. And so this morning, we dive into Psalm 27, and we see that the God that we serve is beautiful. So I'm going to read Psalm 27, and then we'll dive in. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I dread when evildoers came against me to devour my flesh, my foes, my enemies stumbled and fell? Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. I've asked one thing from the Lord. It's what I desire to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of my God, to seek him in his temple, for he will conceal me in his shelter in the days of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock, and then my head will be high above my enemies around me. I will offer sacrifices in his tent with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. Seek his face. Lord, I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. 
You have been my helper. Do not leave me or abandon me, God of my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord cares for me. Because of my adversaries, show me your ways, Lord, and lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing violence. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. What I want to look at in this passage is that God is absolutely beautiful. Now, beauty is an interesting topic. Now, while I believe there is an objective beauty here on earth, much of what we consider beauty is subjective. We have a saying in our culture that says beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But when it comes to God, the Bible affirms that he is intrinsically beautiful, absolutely beautiful, irrefutably beautiful. In theology, this is what we say when we say that God is transcendent or holy or glorious. He is so beautiful that our observing of his beauty isn't needed. We don't make God beautiful by us noticing how beautiful he is. We don't make God more beautiful or less beautiful. What makes most things beautiful in our culture is based on observance and popularity, but not so with God. A.W. Tozer makes a statement which um, I believe is behind me. It says, we're all human beings suddenly to become blind. Still the sun would shine by day and the stars by night, for these owe nothing to the millions who benefit from their light. So were every man on earth to become an atheist, it would not affect God in any way. He is what he is in himself without regard to the other. To believe in him adds nothing to his perfection. To doubt him takes nothing away. And so we could say that God is beauty. And that all true beauty flows from him and points back to him. For as the creator, beauty flashes forth from his being. Like Romans 11 says, for all things are from him and through him and to him. And thus the creation reflects God's beauty. And because we, you and I are created in the image of God, we can create works of beauty. We have the creator's hands, as if it were. And because we have run from our creator... We find this void in our soul that we must fulfill. So we go to search for beauty in everything but God. We look for it in creation around it. So we have a deep need to be captivated by beauty where we will be like a flower without the sun's ray and without water we will eventually shrivel up and die. This is why, friends, you and I need to be captured by the beauty of God. We need to see the glory of God and thus it shouldn't surprise us that the way the enemy attacks is not just to, it, the way the enemy attacks is to keep us from beholding God's beauty, to blind us from the beauty of God, from the glory of God. Second Corinthians says it this way, in this case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of Christ. Now, Satan's main tactic is not just to downplay the beauty of God, but it's to take other things and to lift it up to where other things replace God's beauty. That we find our awe and satisfaction and desire more in stuff or people or possessions instead of God. The Bible has a word for this. It's called idolatry. Good things that ultimately become primary things. So what do you see as beautiful this morning? What captivates your heart's affections? Is it God? And maybe you might be here and you say, well, sometimes it's God, but it's a struggle. And if that's you, welcome to David's life in Psalm 27. Here's David. He wants to be constantly attracted to Jesus' beauty and glory, and he finds that he's not always in that place. He shuffles between being confident and anxious, between trusting and being fearful, all in this one psalm. But I believe that as we 
we'll see in this psalm is an answer to why we need to see the beauty of God, how we see it, and what we do when we don't see it. And in doing so, we find an invitation to come to this gallery of God's majesty, a gallery of God's beauty, and to enjoy him. So three things I want to look at. One, why we need to see the beauty of God. Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I dread when evildoers came against me to devour my flesh, my foes, my enemies stumbled and fell? Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. You go down to verse 9. It says, don't hide your face from me, God. Don't turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me or abandon me, God of my salvation. Even if my mother or father abandon me, the Lord, you care for me. See, when you observe David's situation here, He's under a lot of pressure. There's external attract, attacks. There's a threat on his life as the king. His family has turned on him. Life has not been easy. War is going. Skirmishes are ready to break out at any moment. He's tempted to be afraid, but he is seemingly running to God as a stronghold. And in verse 9 and 10, you get there, you see David sharing his internal disappointment, his loss. His struggle to trust God and feelings of being alone and wondering, God, I need you, yet where are you? David almost sounds like he has some abandonment issues here. And though may, he may not have literally lost his mother or father, he might have at this point. He's giving us this broad perspective of some of the most difficult and intense things in life. Wars or threats of war, abandonment of friends, family turning against him. And in the midst of that, here's the question you have to ask. Why do we need to see the beauty of God? Why do we need to see God as glorious and majestic and marvelous? Because we don't see it a lot in life. When you look around, it's failures, it's disappointments, it's heartaches, it's pain. The truth is we're more afraid than we're confident. We feel more alone than we feel connected we feel more at war in our soul than we feel at peace in our soul. And the reality is before sin entered the world, there was no fear, no loneliness, no battle. But now it seems like that's all that we know. You see, we don't see God's beauty readily because we're blinded by our own sin. And we live in a world that's broken by sin. We have things that we do and things that have been done to us that keep us from seeing the beauty of God. All of us have vices and all of us have wounds. There are relational wars that we've started. There are relational wars that we have been dragged into. We have abandoned people, and yet people have abandoned us. David has all kinds of problems and roadblocks that keep him from the beauty of God. And friends, so do we. There are things in your present and things in your past that keep you from the beauty of God. Maybe it's regret or shame or guilt or wounds or heartache. There are parts of your life story that you wish you could have been written differently, but they're there. They're there. And they keep you often from seeing the beauty of God. See, this is why we gravitate to earthly beauty as a people. We want to forget the images that we've seen. We want to forget the heartaches that we've experienced. We want to push away the pain to the side. And in that process, we want to taste something that's good. We want to experience something that's refreshing. We want to see beauty before us. We want to taste holiness and purity and joy, even if we don't use those terms to describe what we're after. And where do we run for those things in our culture? It's things like music and art. And relationships. Is it any wonder that the fastest growing companies over the last decades, the most profitable businesses, are companies like Apple and Netflix and Samsung and Microsoft and Facebook and Twitter? I would argue that all of these are forms of beauty of people trying to find beauty. Technology has become a means for us to find beauty in our culture because. We're looking for beauty everywhere 
but we don't look for it in God. Friends, the soul will get what the soul needs. And so we, by default mode of the human heart, gravitate toward beauty naturally as a solution for our problems. You and I need something to captivate our hearts and our affections. And the truth is, the danger is that if that, what we're not drawn to is Jesus, we're headed for trouble. Our first parents in the garden, Adam and Eve, had everything that they could imagine, everything they could dream of. But the way that Satan tempted Eve was that he drew her to a forbidden fruit that was pleasant or beautiful to the eye on a tree that was to be desired. You and I will be in danger if we go any length of time without tasting and experiencing the glory of Jesus in our lives. When Jesus ceases to fill our hearts and ceases to satisfy us, our souls will end up going on a silent search for other things that will ultimately captivate our hearts and ultimately destroy us. See, we need beauty But only God's beauty will do. And this is why David here in this psalm is pressing so hard into God. Seeing the beauty of God, friends, will allow you to live in this world, in this crazy world with your head held high because it provides you a rock to stand on when the tide rises. And David knows this. This is why he calls God um, what he does right in the beginning of this passage. God, you are my light. You're my light. This is the only place in the Old Testament where God is called light, which is interesting because when you ask someone to describe God in our culture, they gravitate toward descriptions of light. They describe visions of angels in heaven in a great light or heaven as this bright place where there's no darkness. Why is light a good description of God? To say that light is, to say that God is light is to say that what we just sung, that God You're good. You are good. You are beautiful. Light brings clarity and focus, the ability to see. Light is good for almost everything except when you want to sleep. Other than that, it's always a good thing. This is why in the New Testament, light is applied to Jesus who says that he is the light of the world. It is in him we see and understand the beauty of God. And friends, you and I need this light, and we need to take this light and not re- ignore our regrets or our shames or our guilt or our wounds or our pains, but rather go back to them and let God bring healing and hope and repentance. We need the beauty of God in the face of Christ. And so how do you see the beauty of God? How do you see the beauty of God? Look at verse 4. I've asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire. To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of God, seeking him in his temple. Notice one thing. Not two. Not three. One thing. This is is a language that's firm, that's resolved. This is what I want. This is what I'm getting. David really wants one thing from God. What is it? He wants God. He just wants God. And notice, David is not asking God. He's telling God. He's saying, look, I'm asking to see your beauty, and I'm coming whether you like it or not because I need your beauty for me to live. But how do you see God's beauty? Number one, you dwell. You dwell. The idea behind that word dwell in verse 4 is literally to set camp. It's the idea of nomads who have been traveling from one place to another and they're tired and they pitch their tents and they say, we're going to settle here. We're not going anywhere for a while. This is where we're going to say, we're going to set up camp. David is basically saying, God, I'm tired of mediocrity. Tired of simply seeking you periodically or only in times of crisis or only when things go bad. He's going to dwell with God, like it or not. It's like David got a hold of his inner man and he says to him, and he basically says, David, you're going to stay here whether you like it or not. There is this commitment there. There's this permanence there. There's almost this hard-headedness here in David's life. But what does that look like? What does he mean by saying, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord? Is he at this point 
pondering, resigning as king to become a priest who literally lived in the temple? Is David giving up the crown so that he could wear those thick, heavy robes that the priest wore? Is he saying that he's going to become a monk in a monastery? No, David is simply saying, I want to live my life in such a way that it feels like there is this unbroken contact with God, that he's always with him, that he actually lives with God. You say, why this obsession with going to the temple, the house of God, to, to the temple in the Psalms? Because the Jews knew that God's presence was everywhere, but they also understood the temple's holy of holies was where his special presence was. And it was good for them to be close to it, to be in it. It was, we could see, we could say the gallery of God's beauty and they wanted access to go in and see God. And you see this obsession throughout the Psalm, Psalm 43, send out your light and your truth, let them lead me, let them bring me to your holy hill, to your dwelling, then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Psalm 63 says it this way, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. But I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. And Psalm 84 says, For a day in your courts, a day, God, with you is better than a thousand days elsewhere. Friends, you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find the distinction between corporate worship of God and the private worship of God, especially in the Old Testament. For the psalmist, being with the people of God, learning and praying and singing was essential for beholding the beauty of the glory of God. I'll go as far to say that you can't really see the beauty of God without being part of the body of Christ without being part of the church. Not necessarily in this building, but being an active part with your brothers and sisters. The church, friends, is a people, not a building. It is a gallery of God's beauty, and you only harm yourself by being detached from it. You only harm yourself by not being connected to it. God's most loving plan for you and most profitable place for you is in wholehearted relationship with him through your local church body. Now, I know some of you have been burned by the church. Some of you have had horrible experiences. But friends, the church is not your enemy. Sin is your enemy. And people have sinned. But the church is the bride of Christ. So be careful how you treat, for Jesus is jealous for his bride. Don't think for a moment that you can thrive and be effective without holding hands with your brothers and sisters in the local church body. And you could say, look, listen, I could see God in the beauty of when I go on a hike or I could see beauty of God on a sunset or at the beach. But the Bible is saying you really can't see the beauty of God out there until you see the beauty of God in here. It is from being in the house of God, connected to God's people, that you get the glasses to be able to see the beauty of God out there. Why? Why? Because central to corporate worship in the Old Testament was sacrifice. And in the center of the Holy of Holies where God's glory and beauty lied was a place of sacrifice. Beauty appears where there is sacrifice. And all of this was prophetic and pointing toward Jesus where there is real beauty at the cross. See, this is where you are to be captivated Redemption seen at the cross via the gathered church gathering together as we preach the gospel, as we take communion, gives you glasses to see the beauty of God in everyday life. This is why this time is so important. This is why this is sacred. This is why you have to be here. You have to dwell with the people of God. Set up camp in the house of God. You need to be part of the body. God's not looking for people who just warm the seats every Sunday saying they've done their duty. God wants you to thrive, to see his beauty, to see his glory. You need to be here. Number two, you have to gaze. To gaze literally means 
that you stare at something long enough to where you can't help yourself from doing so. You can't get enough of the sight. You stare so long that it leaves a memory that's imprinted on your brain. People in Dallas do this with traffic accidents that happen on the other side of the road, right? Um, but notice David is staring at the temple. What is he staring at? He's staring at the beauty of God. Now, this is not a vision of God, but the difference between intellectually knowing that God is beautiful and actually finding a sense of God's beauty and glory in the earth. Friends, there's a difference between having an opinion that God is holy and gracious and marvelous and having a sense of that loveliness and beauty and holiness and grace overwhelm your soul. See, so when we move from the intellectual knowledge to a spiritual sensing of God, we are finding him beautiful. So to gaze is basically the same idea as meditating. We ponder, we reflect, we meditate on God's person, on God's attributes, on his deeds, until we find them becoming spiritually real to us. Hopefully if you're new today or new to the faith, you're sensing a difference between what we're talking about and religion. You see, religion attempts to know God and get close to God in order to get something from God. But gospel gazing, being captured by God, is done to just see God, and it is enough and it's effective. We're not here to get something from God. We're gazing as God because he's already given. We're gazing to see the beauty of the one who gave his life so that you and I can be called the sons and daughters of God. Religion is saying, God, I go to church, so you have to do everything I want. The gospel is saying, God, even if you slay me, still I will praise you because I trust you. Some of you... are religious. You're here, and you think because you're here, God has to make your life easy, that everything has to be perfect. And yet you never find that in Scripture. The disciples come to Jesus, and every one of them loses their life. Not gets an easy life. The Gospel says, because of Jesus, no matter what you go through, the assurance is I'm there with you, that you're not alone, that I will not fail you. See, to religious people, God is useful, especially in times of trouble, but to followers of Jesus, friends, to followers of Jesus, God is beautiful regardless of their situation. What do you want? Do you want God? Do you want beauty? Or do you simply want God for what he could do for you? If you aim at the beauty of God as the end in and of itself, you'll find a God that does great things for you. But if you aim for a God that simply can do stuff for you, you're going to get neither beauty or good from him. And the last thing there of how you find God is you inquire. To inquire of his temple to seek his temple means not so much a preoccupation with God's person as much as it is with God's will. The word inquire, the word seek, is to seek an answer from God. The idea is the combining gaze and inquire. In seeking the beauty of God is this preoccupation, not with just the person of God, but simply saying, God, what do you want from me? What do you desire from me? And notice how all of this dwelling, his gazing and inquiring absorbs the fears of David in verse 5. He's afraid here, but he absorbs, he dwells, he gazes, he inquires of God. In verse 5 says, he will conceal me in his shelter in the days of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock, and then my head will be high above my enemies around me. I will offer sacrifices in his tents with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to my God. 
Does he mean here in verse 6 that because he is dwelling with God and gazing upon God and inquiring about God that his enemies will be unable to touch him, that he will be protected from all calamity and harm and danger? That's not what David's saying, friends. If the enemies wanted to attack him, they could either walk into that tent or they could just wait for him to come out. But this has to mean that the contemplation of God, the dwelling with God, the abiding in God, there's something internally in you that it dissolves your fears. His mind, in a sense, is taken off of himself. He's so aware of God's beauty that death doesn't matter to him. Circumstances don't matter to him. His own reputation doesn't matter to him. See, this is what happens when you see the beauty of God. This is what Jesus means when he says, you begin to die to yourself. Listen, friends, there's no shortcut There's no secret. It's simply being at church, praying, reading the Bible that consistently allows you to see God as simply beautiful. There's some of you that are saying, but that's so simple. That's so childish. It's just monotony. There's nothing there. What's the real secret? Maybe that's our problem. We've moved on from the simplicity of following Jesus. We've grown up. If you have kids, you know that especially when they're little, it it doesn't take much to wow them or fascinate them. When they're infants, you can make faces at them or you could touch their belly button and they could just start giggling. Right? They'll just start laughing uncontrollably. And you can do that for hours on end. They don't get bored with it. When they become toddlers, it could be something like carrying them on your back or throwing them in the air and catching them. And their words will be, do it again. Do it again. Right? Sadly, they eventually grow out of that phase where anything mommy or dad does is funny and they get out of that phase. It's called the teenage years. Um, but until then, it's like you can get them captivated by the simple things. See, children have this abounding vitality because they're free in spirit and they have this fierce and free spirit. And therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. They will keep saying things like, do it again, one more time. Do it again. And you're doing the exact same thing and you're bored out of your mind. Your hand is tired. You're exhausted. But they're just laughing and having fun. Why? Because grown-ups, we don't, we're not strong enough to enjoy monotony. But maybe, just maybe God is strong enough to revel in monotony. It is possible, and I'm totally guessing here, that every morning God says to the sun, do it again. Every evening God says to the moon, do it again. Every spring God says to the ground, do it again. And flowers, verse 4. It may not be automatic necessities that makes daisies alike or roses alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately because he hasn't gotten tired of making them. It may be that you and I have grown sin and grown old while God has his eternal appetite for infancy. It may be that our father is younger than we are when it comes to what he delights in and he enjoys. Simple things. Read your Bible. Pray every day. Go to church. I can't tell you the number of times people will come to me and say, I want to go deeper with Jesus. And I'll say, how's scripture reading? How's prayer life? I'm like, it doesn't exist. You want to go deeper with Jesus has to begin there. Some days it's monotonous. Some days it feels like this is a pain. You get through Leviticus. It's painful, <laughs> right? Some days it feels like there's nothing coming out of it. But when you delight in him, God will show up. See, we can't see the beauty of God, friends, because 
we refuse to be like little children and exult in the monotonous. This is why Jesus said in Matthew, he said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and you become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. See, friends, we have to learn to exalt the monotonous. Doing the same thing over and over again till beauty is revealed to us, till the gallery of God's beauty opens up to us. Some days you will open the scripture and God, you just see God there. Some days you open scripture and there's nothing there. But listen, in those days where you see that there's nothing there, I promise you God is doing something in you. He is. Oftentimes we think that flowers are dead in the winter or trees are dead in the winter, but they're not really dead. It's in the winter when nothing seems to be showing up on the outside that the roots are taking deeper ground. And some days it might feel like winter that nothing's going on, but God is doing something underneath that you don't see or you don't know, but friends, he is doing something. You've got to trust him. You've got to get into habits of saying, I've got to pray. I've got to read scripture, figure out ways to do it. Set reminders on your phone to say, I will pause and just reflect on God. Meditate on him day and night. It doesn't get more complicated than being in church community where people love you, care for you, reading God's word where you could hear his words to you and delighting in prayer where you talk to him. It's as simple as that. Doing the same thing over and over till beauty is revealed to us. And so let me close by saying, what do we do when we can't see the beauty of God? And this is where David does with the rest of the psalm. David begins his pursuit of the experience of verses 4 to 6 by preparing himself to see God's beauty. When I was doing scripture reading a few weeks ago, I came to the king, in Second Kings where Elijah is confronting the prophets of Baal. You guys remember this story? Baal, the 500 prophets of Baal are on one side, Elijah's on the other side, and they're having this confrontation to see my God is better than your God competition, right? And they're just competing with each other. And after the prophets of Baal fail to set, get Baal to send fire down from heaven, it's Elijah's turn. Elijah gets the altar ready. And then he waits for God to send down fire. And he does a couple things. He not, first of all, he stacks wood upon wood upon wood. And he, then he drenches the altar with water. And then he simply waits for fire to come down. I think that's what David is doing in Psalm 27. He's doing exactly what Elijah did on the mountain when he built the altar, stacking wood upon wood, waiting for the fire of God to come down and light it up. Sometimes, friends, this is all we can do when we're waiting for the Spirit to break through and open the gallery of the beauty of God. Just keep the monotony of stacking wood and wait like the disciples did in Acts 2 for the Spirit to come and light the wood on fire. The image of preparing an altar is helpful because it shows us that, friends, while we wait for God to show up, we're not called to be passive. It shows us also that we're not in control. There is no formula out there that automatically connects us to God. We must rely on God to come to us. And so we just simply stack wood and stack wood and stack wood. Let me give you four woods that we have to stack. Number one, repentance. Verse 7 says it this way. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. In both the verses 7 and 9, David shows that he recognizes that, listen, I don't deserve to be in your beautiful art gallery. I don't deserve to access here. Sin is blocking the vision of the beauty. There is no vision of God, friends, where there is no repentance. Repentance removes the cloud so we could see the blazing sun of God's beauty. Without it, without it we're in a fog. Matthew 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Listen, you can't expect to see the beauty of your creator when all week you've been lusting over the beauty of the creation. 
you and I, we need to make repentance a daily aspect of our lives. It should be a daily thing. Repentance isn't something you do one time, then you're saved, and you never do it again. It's an everyday thing. We have to... There are things in our lives that distract us from the beauty of God. And many times, these are good things that we have made ultimate things, idols. But the good thing... But the good news is, as a Christian, God is never far. As a matter of fact, God never went anywhere. We're the ones who ran away. But when we reach out to God, we find light breaking through the darkness. 1 John 1 says it this way, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number one, we repent. Number two, we resolve. Here's the second wood that you place on the altar. Resolve. Verse 8. My heart says this about you. Seek his face. Lord, I will seek your face. I love David's resolve here. It's this sanctified, holy hard-headedness. He knows God wants him to seek him. So basically David says, well, my heart, your spirit is saying seek you. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to seek you. This involves a resolve to just be still. Solitude and silence is one of the hardest things for us to do. But friends, it is absolutely essential for beholding the beauty of God. But on verse 13, I am certain of this, that I will see God's goodness in the land of the living. Now friends, David is not talking about circumstances here. He's not saying, I know that things are going to get better. He's not doing positive self Help here. In fact, the opposite is true. David is saying, I believe that in the midst of clouds, in the midst of rain, in the midst of a thunderstorm, in the midst of hurricanes, in the midst of chaos, I'm going to be able to see God, and I'm going to be able to see that he is beautiful. He is going to let me into the art gallery. And notice, it's not, well, one day when I get to heaven that I will get to see God's beauty. That's true. But David is talking about now here in the land of the living. This is biblical hope. This is assurance that God is going to do great things because God is a great God. One of my favorite books that I read in college was an autobiography of a missionary by the name of John Patton. He's a young man that heads to the islands of Aniwa in the South Pacific. Before he goes, he, before he went, he said, I claimed Aniwa for Jesus. And by the grace of God, Aniva will worship at the Savior's feet. And there's a man in Patton's life by the name of Mr. Dickinson who tried to discourage Patton, saying that you're throwing your life away. You could have so many other opportunities. Why would you do this? That you're going to go and preach to cannibals or you're literally going to be eaten by cannibals. And this is what Patton said to him. He said, Mr. Dickinson, you're advanced in years now. And your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring Jesus, it will not make any difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or whether I'm eaten by worms. And in the great day of my resurrection, my resurrection will body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of my risen Savior. How is your resolve to seek after God? Do you believe that he will look upon the goodness of God in the land of the living, that he will reveal himself and that he will use you in the lives of the people that he has placed you in? Listen, God has put you here for a reason, and it's not simply to take up space. Number three, obedience. Here's the third word. Verse 11, because of my adversaries, show me your way, God. Lead me on a level path. David knows that he's not seeing the beauty of God, so he expresses this willingness to say, God, rearrange my life so that I will be more obedient to you. This is a searching to make sure, God, am I following you? Am I on the right path? Am I going in the right direction? 
Friends, when's the last time you checked your feet? Are you on the right path? Are you following God's revealed will for your life? Are you simply asking God to bless your endeavors? Or are you saying, God, whatever you desire for me, let me do? See, David wanted off the roller coaster ride of sin and onto the straight path of God's way. He's done playing around with sin. He wants to see beauty, real beauty, which is only found in God. He wants into the gallery. Maybe this morning you feel weak in your resolve to obey God because you feel that it's not worth it. But can I encourage you, keep keeping those wood onto the altar. I promise you, Jesus is worth it. And number four, patience. Here's the final piece of wood that you put on the altar. It's patience. Verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart be courageous Wait for the Lord. David now just basically sits back after he's built the altar. Wood has been piled up as high as the eye could see, and he waits for God to light it up. But he's not just sitting there. David, in that moment, speaks to you and I this morning. He says, Keep building the altar. Keep stacking the wood of truth on top. Keep dousing it with the fuel of prayer and then wait for God to throw fire on it. See, this is where the world really sees the value of God's beauty in us. That when we don't see it, we keep seeking after it by faith. Oh, I know that they're laughing at me as I lay this wood down. I know they're mocking my pursuit of Jesus, but friends, keep stacking it together. Wait for the Lord together, yet pursue the Lord together. You see, David waited for the Lord, and in hope, he knew that God would provide the key to open the gallery to see God's beauty to him and the entire world. You say, what's that key? Glad you asked. See, the Bible affirms over and over that God dwells in light and that he is utterly glorious and beautiful on his throne and that the angels surround him in glory, praising him in his beauty. But while all of that true, all of that is true of the scene in heaven, that beauty is shut off to you and I. We can't see that beauty wrapped in holiness because as sinners we are excluded from the presence of God. And God knew that, which is why 750 years after David penned these words, Jesus shows up in human flesh. You see, Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus emptied himself of his beauty. It was not that he ceased to be God, but he took on the flesh of humanity. And you would think that as human, that as a man, as God-man, Jesus must have been the most stunning, most handsome man ever to live, yet that's not what Scripture says. Isaiah 53 says, He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form, no majesty that we would look at him, no beauty that we would desire him. What? He was as attractive as spinach leaves. But it gets worse. Because instead of receiving him and welcoming him as he came to open the doors of the gallery of God's beauty for us, Instead, we beat him even before he gets to the door. And we drag him to a little hill. We nail him to a cross. We stood before him. We laugh at him and we mock him and we kill him. Isaiah 52, just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he didn't even look like a man. His form did not resemble a human being. The beautiful God lost all of his beauty. Why? Wasn't he powerful enough to stop all this? Oh, yes. But it was all part of the plan for without losing beauty, God wouldn't have the key to open the gallery of God's beauty to us and also not have the key to change us so that you and I can enter in and see his beauty. Do you see this? that he became disfigured for your sin and my sin. He lost beauty so that you could be made beautiful and could see beauty forever in the face of God. 
Let me close with this verse, Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn. Verse 3, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, expanded clothes instead of despair. And they will be called righteous trees, planted by the Lord himself to glorify him. He took your ashes. He took your mourning. He took your despair. And in exchange, he gives us a beautiful crown, an oil of gladness and splendid clothes. This is what we call the great exchange. It was God's plan to break Jesus for our sake so that we could have the key to enter the gallery of God's beauty. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. May we be a community. May we be a people that never loses our awe and wonder of God. Because the moment we lose our awe and wonder of God, we will get distracted by everything else. But when we are captured by his beauty, when we are captured by his majesty, when we're captured by everything that Jesus exchanged so that we could get this crown, this fragrance, this splendid clothes, Our worship moves from just something that's in the mind to something that overflows from our heart. This morning, if you're here, and if this is just intellectual for you, I plead with you, I beg you, run to Jesus. Draw to him. Dwell in him. Gaze in him. Inquire of him. Pursue him with everything that you have. See him for more than just someone that could do something for you. See him for all that he has already done for you. We're about to go to communion. In a few moments, the team is going to sing, and you will have the opportunity to reflect on what you've just heard. And then you'll have an opportunity to come and take the piece of bread the bread that reflects the body of God where body of Jesus that had no beauty or majesty that was broken for you and me so that we could be brought in. The bread, the juice represent the body and the blood of Jesus that was broken and poured out for us. Can I invite you, would you for a moment just gaze at the beauty of Jesus? Would you let him capture you this morning? Would you keep pursuing him? Our fathers, we're here as we come to this table. We come knowing that this is not our right. We don't deserve to come. But Jesus, but Jesus, he willingly took our place on the cross. He died the death that we should have died, lived the life that we should have lived. So this morning we come partaking of this table, being reminded that we are the family of God. Would you work in us? Would you be glorified through us? In Jesus' name.